this was just to show you that sometime uh, working with museums does not mean often working with uh, cultural heritage museum but also natural history museum or other kind of uh, things that still can be computed in 3D. In this case, was a, it's a small thing that we did for a temporary exposition about whales and how whales have been represented many times in uh, cultural heritage like drawings and uh, books uh, and other things. So what we did was to, to go to a very near um, natural history museum where they have, uh, uh, well actually they have a lot of complete skeleton of, uh, of whales, but we just acquired this thing, which is the mandible of uh, a sperm whale, that is one of the two main uh, the, the whales that have, uh, that filters water, so they do not have teeth, and other that have very large teeth. So we got this uh, 3D model. This is uh, three meter and something in, uh, in length. And uh, uh, we acquired also one of those an anatomical models that they have to show the total size and total shape of the object. And uh, a colleague of mine that is she's very skilled in, uh, in texturing and um, creating uh, um, the color information, she hand painted this whole model. Uh, um, starting from photos uh, and example of the, the pattern, the kind of scarring uh, that uh, sperm whale have. And then we mounted this uh, very short video that is a cyclic uh, video, so it just goes on and on, and they will use it in the, in the exposition just to show the, this, uh, this anatomical part plus uh, the entire uh, shape and appearance of the of the um, of the whale. It was something that I just left in the middle when I came here and then uh, a, p a couple of colleagues finished rendering the video so they just sent me, I just wanted to see how it looked on, uh, on a big screen. But again, other parts of the job, sometimes you use for scientific purposes, sometimes you use it also for the presentation to the public which is as important as the um, documentation and so on. So I want that uh, today will be a bit of uh, mix and match. We will, I will uh, finish uh, showing a couple of things uh, uh, from yesterday, so about 3D from, uh, from photos. Then I will tell you about uh, one project where we combine uh, the uh, data coming from the different sources, so from 3D uh, scanning, terrestrial uh, scan, and 3D uh, from, uh, from photos, so trying to give you an idea of what happens, what can uh, go wrong and uh, so on. And then we will be, uh, we will be back on uh, processing uh, some data, I will show some of the things about the alignment that I didn't show a couple of days ago. I will try to go in different directions, so I will keep you, um, I will keep showing uh, different aspect of this uh, work. So, very briefly, I told you that uh, SketchUp has this uh, uh, this functionality about uh, uh, that lets you model things uh, using a single uh, uh, photo. So what I do is to import JPEG and I use it as uh, uh, photo match, uh, you will in the English version, uh, version you will see, uh, use it as a photo match. The and I will import the photo that I showed you. Now, what happens? I have uh, a 
the photo match interface, that is uh, this thing here, plus uh, all these uh, lines and reference mark. Uh, what I have to do, what the system asks you, is to place uh, these lines on the photo, trying to be as uh, precise as possible and to follow uh, the, um, the vanishing lines. So the two horizontal vanishing line, you will have to match it by taking these points and going and attach this line to the vanishing line of the photo. So the idea is to, as uh, in all the situation where you have to do similar stuff, uh, is uh, always try to put the lines, the point, uh, or everything else well distributed over the image. So I, I theoretically can put the second red line here, but it's much better if the second one is far from the first one. So I can come here and put it uh, on this other line. I'm trying to be precise, but in any case, it's better to start rough and then go and correct a small misalignment. So another line that is visible may be the one here that connects the top row of all these decoration. And another one ideally should be here. Now that I placed this line, you see that all these very strange uh, science fiction style interface with all these, uh, these lines, they line up uh, with the all the vanishing line of my building. So I matched the more or less the focal length plus the point of view. I still have to place something which is my origin. Once I place my origin, I can start drawing on the uh, following the things on the photo. But since uh, everything, uh, the, the 3D space matches uh, what I see in the photo, it's like I'm tracing line inside a three-dimensional space. Uh, also in this case, uh, I have the same all, uh, issue about the size of uh, the object. So at the moment, I am reconstructing something that is uh, uh, a 3D representation of the object, by, uh, but I know nothing about its scale. There's a way to scale it now, and there's a way to scale it afterward. So, to in order to scale it now, you may know about the height of one window, so you go and place your origin. in a position of which you know the, the eight, and then uh, was it, uh, I don't remember the key, but you have to move, uh, you have to tell that this window is like, uh, yeah, it may be one meter, uh, one meter and a half, and then you have to press uh, I don't remember the key. No. Not even this one. So you have uh, this, uh, this number 
tells you how far are two of these lines. There's a key, I can't remember which one, sorry, I'm going to, uh, I'm go I normally work using uh, MeshLab, uh, Blender, uh, SketchUp, uh, sometimes uh, Maya, and all these um, shortcuts, uh, sometimes they just mix out. So the way you do it is, you put the number that you know, so I know that this, uh, this window is one meter and a half, and then I will stretch using a zoom feature, this line until it gets to the bottom. So this step will be one meter and, uh, and a half. Otherwise, especially if you're working on uh, this kind of stuff, it's uh, always possible to scale it afterward. In any case, there's a way built in in order to do the scaling. So now I'll place my origin somewhere meaningful. And I will start, first of all, I will check that if I move uh, the origin around, you see that the red line here matches with this red line, and the green line more or less matches with this green line. OK? So I can go somewhere that looks like a good point to start. You will find in the instruction that you never have to start from a point on the ground because points on the ground are the ones where the ground is never even. So it's not a 90 degree perfect. But in this point, so uh, what I see here is that uh, I have uh, two convergent parts of a building plus a, a small thing coming out. So you see the geometry that I expect is this one. And then this goes down. And then there's another panel here. So you see this uh, here. And then comes out. And then in this way. So I place my origin here. And I say, OK, complete. Now my view match uh, the, uh, the view of the, of the photo. And I can start using that thing that I told you. Uh, SketchUp let you draw on the three-dimensional space. Normally, what you do is to draw following one of the axes. So now I have uh, that point that is exactly on, uh, um, on the middle of this uh, raising uh, edge. So if I go down on the vertical axis, I'm following exactly the edge. If I go down on the green axis, I follow that other edge. The fact is, you can tell that uh, I start drawing, and I'm moving on the green axis, and then now I'm moving on the red axis, that I am following the shape of the object. But it is uh, quite manual, uh, this process. And the kind of precision that I may expect uh, is not so high, but still good enough uh, for a lot of application. So you see that the software tried to help you. So I'm going down with this line. At, at one point, when I reach the same height, uh, that I reached before, it automatically stop and tell you, it may, it may be that you want to stop exactly where you stopped before. So sketching here, then I go in this place, and I see I, I stopped too early, but well, I see that here the, the windows is going in this way, like this. So this uh, thing goes on and down, but it's not on the same level. So I did something wrong here.
So you cannot, for example, in this case, you cannot see this internal corner of the window. So you will go down here when you can, where you can actually see the front corner, and then you will go down from the inside. And since the software automatically stops at the same height, it will be possible to uh, do it. So now I'm uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know, the, 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 when, you, when you trace uh, something, but you are tracing it in a three-dimensional space. So if I, oops, all the lines that I traced are in a three-dimensional space, which matches the three-dimensional space of the, uh, of the building. And then you go on and on and on. It's, uh, it's not really fast, because you are doing modeling. This is assisted modeling. So in this sense, uh, this method is way, way slower than the rest. But still, starting from one photo, you have uh, the possibility to reconstruct an object with a uh, good uh, level of accuracy. This thing is incredibly helpful when you have to model, uh, most of the time, the environment of something. So and you're not using this on your main object, but uh, it may be that the statue is inside a larger complex, uh, or in uh, for a lot of applications. We have used it a lot when we were working on things like image-based lighting, uh, or uh, <coughs> inserting if, um, digital elements inside real photos. So, this kind of environment, uh, room uh, with windows, with desk, uh, and uh, this kind of thing works like a charm. It's really fast, uh, and you obtain a, a model composite of very few triangle, which is perfect for all the experiment about occlusion uh, and uh, three-dimensional uh, um, illumination. So let's put this down. Then, the other software that I wanted to show you, because it's used uh, um, <coughs> a lot in cultural heritage, is Photoscan. Uh, I forgot, yesterday uh, someone was not able to, to get uh, the data, so let's get the further uh, line, and so you can copy. Uh, the, the example data set plus uh, um, visual SFM. This is uh, uh, Photoscan. This software, as I said, has become uh, more or less the standard tool used in the cultural heritage from 3D from, uh, for 3D from photos. Why? Because it's uh, quite cheap. The educational uh, license is uh, around 60, 60 euro. And uh, the pro license is a bit more costly, but if you work in survey or, for example, if you own a drone, uh, all the pro features are incredibly helpful. So the process of creating 3D model is more or less the same. You load some images, you compute, you align those images, and then you get the, the sparse cloud plus the camera calibration, and then the dense cloud. This software may also compute um, the 3D model. So this is an example that I did yesterday before coming. It's again one of the examples that are in the data set. It's a statue without a head that is uh, in, uh, in a monastery in Spain. So this is part of a huge portal, all sculptured, so a lot of detail around. And uh, uh, we took the photos 
years ago with a very old uh, digital camera, so the quality of the photo itself uh, is not really high. And you see that again we moved at different height, at a different distance, trying to frame this part of the object. It's not a perfect coverage, we just wanted to see if the method was working. But in the end, it turns out uh, pretty well, and mo on most of the software works perfectly. So uh, it's a good data set uh, to test. Again, all the data set that I gave you are free of use. So don't <coughs> worry about uh, property, about uh, privacy on uh, those data set. All the models that I gave you are all object of uh, not that high uh, uh, value as a cultural heritage, except for my, my gargoyle that I loved uh, to have all those gargoyles in office, so those are really important objects, but not from a cultural heritage point of view, or are uh, things that we did as a test, so you can use it also. The church uh, without the roof uh, is still uh, uh, free to use. So the, the data set is more or less the same thing as I showed you, so different height, different distances uh, covering the object. Photoscan was able to, first of all, when you align the cameras, when you do the first uh, uh, calibration and orientation, you obtain these. So you see that the position and orientation of the different camera is uh, more or less coherent with what you have done. Always check this, even though, as uh, we said, and uh, with a couple of you, we, we, we stayed here after the lesson and we discussed a bit about this thing, about the camera and how well the camera uh, comes out. Some of the camera that you may obtain may not be exactly the physical camera that you uh, used. Sometimes you will see um, point of view which are farther away or closer. This is because it's the matching is not an exact matching. What counts is everything here make things work, even though it's not uh, <laughs> really physical. Um, the, uh, the 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 determination of the camera. So this is the sparse cloud. And uh, the next step is uh, asking for a dense cloud to give you uh, some timing, because I don't want to do it uh, here, because the first step of aligning all these photos, which are a bit larger than the one of the niche that I uh, showed you, and uh, more, it took uh, uh, from five to seven minutes, something of the kind. The dense cloud took uh, more than half an hour. Things uh, uh, really explode after a while. So expect that if you add uh, 10 photo more, it's not like a couple of minutes more. It can take uh, a lot of time. We have had reconstruction, and we'll show a couple of examples later, that took uh, an entire night of processing. It's uh, perfectly normal. If you exaggerate with the number of photos, with the resolution, and so on, it can take forever. Fortunately, uh, Photoscan has also a concept of uh, chunk. So you can uh, work on different chunk of data, on different set of photo, subset of your photo, and then put all the things together. If you are able, work in a single batch, work in a single chunk, because uh, the process of uh, uh, finding the, the, the alignment, so the, uh, the calibration and orientation, and the bundle adjustment and the cloud creation rely a lot on coherence. So even though it is possible to have the upper part of the statue in a set of photos and the lower part of the statue in a set of photos, and then put all the things together, you will get a better result if you have something that gives uh, coherence and uh, um, rigidity 
to the system. This is still uh, a system where you, let's say, you are aligning data coming from different sources. So the problem of alignment where you can have uh, the formation because the overlap is too small and the object is not closed may still happen in these cases. So if it is possible, work in a single batch. If the things become too complex, try to create batches with uh, some uh, strong overlap or, for example, that is what we have done uh, in uh, one case that I will show you after uh, this, uh, try to keep uh, one set of photos that covers the entire structure common among the two separate chunk. Uh, Photoscan <laughs> Uh, gives you some option. The, the, the system that I showed you before, the, the visual uh, SFM, it's like align photo, uh, do the cloud, do the dense cloud. That's it. If you want to change parameters, you need to dive into the software and change uh, a couple of times a, a file with the configuration. Here you have uh, a different option. It is possible to align photo uh, where you, when you know more or less the, uh, the position of a photo, so it's possible to give an initial estimate. It is possible to import uh, the position, the orient calibration and the orientation of the photo. So it's possible to use Photoscan also as just the second step. It imports a couple of formats. One is uh, a format which is called uh, out, dot out, that is the output of a software called uh, Bundler. Sorry, which is uh, one of the tool, uh, one of the earliest tool that did the initial alignment. So starting from a set of photo, you get uh, this, and it also imports cameras in other format. Take a look at the documentation. Again, there's not a standard way to save uh, a camera, but the uh, different software that can export camera in different uh, um, formats. So you can bypass the initial if you have a way to precisely calibrate your photo, or your photo are already, uh, you know exactly the position because you created some kind of rig where all the, the, the cameras are in a specific position, it is possible to use Photoscan only to create a dense cloud and a 3D model. A lot of people are using rig, rigs in the sense of uh, structures, uh, with uh, a lot of camera. The position of the camera is always fixed, and has been uh, pre-calibrated using some photogrammetric uh, approach, so manually picking points or going and using a uh, marker. So you have a very good calibration and orientation. And they're uh, using this rig to acquire, for example, humans. Doing a 3D scan of a human being, uh, it's not easy because uh, you need to move the scanner around and everyone moves. So even small movement, you that are breathing, because hopefully you are alive, uh, this simple change of geometry means that the things will never attach together well. So one way to acquire a human being is to have multiple scanners at the same time. Multiple scanner is a mess because it requires a lot of, ma of money, but if you go and buy uh, this uh, very cheap uh, digital camera that now are more or less uh, uh, le less than a hundred uh, dollar, and you buy twenty, and all around uh, you you place them in a fixed position. You have a stable rig for acquiring in a single shot because they are all controlled by computer, so they all shot at the same time. You can create a realistic 3D model of human uh, beings, or also other stuff. So if you are if your project needs to acquire a lot of uh, small objects, for example, 
instead of every time doing the shooting sequence and then import and then align, it may be the case that placing uh, 10, for, uh, 10 uh, cameras in a, in a good position and then you control them remotely and you obtain a, a viable uh, point cloud. So it is also possible to do so. If the camera, uh, especially when you're working with drones, it is uh, often uh, possible to have the GPS position of uh, the photo because most of the drones use a GPS system to navigate, well, to fly, and uh, when they shoot the photo, they mark inside the EXIF the position of the photo. So this software also uses this data in order to have an initial uh, sketch, and also if all the photo contains uh, the GPS data, the 3D model is already georeferenced. Remember that the GPS uh, data coming from uh, a drone is uh, reliable in the sense that you are not colliding with the building, but is uh, not as precise as a survey GPS, uh, the one that have the fixed antenna and then the mobile antenna. So it's good because you have uh, one GPS position for maybe 100 photos. So in the end, again, it's also a way to reduce the air of the GPS. But still, you may want to use some uh, ground control points. This software also uses ground control points. Uh, if you are using the Pro version, the, uh, all these uh, features that are used to put your data in a specific reference system. So you may use data coming from a terrestrial laser scanner or you may use a point on the ground measured with a, with a differential <laughs> GPS, so very precisely. And when it does the bundle adjustment, it takes in account the point that the SIFT has matched, plus the GPS uh, coordinates of the, of the photo, plus uh, all the other points that you may have supplied using uh, total station and so on. So he is doing uh, already the uh, multi-level alignment. So he will take care of optimizing the position and the data according to all the available positioning system. So no positioning like in this case, no posi uh, just the point plus the total station or total station plus uh, GPS. This is why it, it is used a lot, because it automatically computes a lot of stuff that is normally required by survey. And uh, it works really, really well. The, the, in the latest update, they changed a bit the engine that uh, does the match. And now, with uh, things uh, coming from drones, it works really, really, really well. There are very cheap drones around, and remember that if you do not have a drone, you may still use uh, a kite, uh, use a cheap camera, possibly, because if it just goes down, uh, it's not a good idea. And there are a lot of people that are still using helium balloons, which may be a bit costlier sometimes than, uh, than a drone, but they are much more stable, and they can stay on uh, in flying for the entire day, while a drone normally has a very short uh, time on, of flying. So, getting back, this is the, uh, the calibration of the, of the camera. You can export the camera in different format. You have some feedback on the air of the fitting. This is the sparse cloud. So, these are the points that the software has used in order to compute this uh, camera calibration and orientation. Then you get the dense cloud. So these are all the points that have been generated. You may obtain uh, a cloud at a different resolution. Since this software try to be as easy as possible uh, to use, you do not have uh, a, a very precise way there are different settings, low, medium, high, very high. 
what the what does this setting mean? It basically, when I say that you generate one vertex for each pixel of each camera, I lied. Uh, it's something that you may do, but it normally do generate too much information. So what all the software do is subsample this image using some uh, um, some interesting uh, subsampling. It's not a crude subsampling and they compute only one pixel every every three every four every five I don't know so they have a, le a, a way to reduce the amount of data otherwise if you just think about how many photos and how many pixels you have in these photos it will be too many points uh, of course, the accuracy uh, is better when you use more points. So if you go in high or very high, you get a better, um, a better cloud. Well, a better cloud. Remember that you still always have some error in the calibration and orientation. So even though the, the process succeeded and uh, uh, in this case, the cloud is pretty good. This does not um, imply that you can use uh, all the points because uh, there may still be some uh, misal small misalignment. So what happens normally is that you start from medium or high and take a look at the data. If the point cloud is really, really good, you may think about getting the next uh, result. So I try to increase uh, these parameters and have a larger point cloud. And take also a look at on how many points you have already generated. Remember that in the end, you will need to create a 3D model. You will need to use this data. So points is not money that the more you have, the happier you are. Points, after a while, becomes a burden because you have too many and your hard drive can hold it anymore and your video card doesn't, um, is, is unable to, um, to work on it anymore. So always look at the data, save, export this point cloud, take a look at the point cloud. This software is, uh, work with uh, generate point cloud with color and normal. So I can see it here inside, or I can also just export these points. And uh, um, cloud. And I'm uh, using the data um, from the dense cloud. I can also export the, export the sparse cloud if I want to. I save the point color and the point normal using binary encoding. So now it's exporting. If I go here, I have this, uh, this file, this cloud. One thing about uh, Photoscan, it seems that every time it flips the model, so th when every time you open the model, the model is in a very strange position. We never understood why. I mean, it, it should uh, orient it according to the first couple of photos that we found. But it seems that it's always in some very bizarre position. Again, it's not a problem. It's just a fact that the object is uh, not straight. You will put it straight later. So we look at the data and we see that the data is more or less good, but if I get close, I see a bit more noise and that there are some point that are not really on the surface. And if I render color none, you see that, uh, yes, we have a lot of the detail, but we can get a bit more. So in this case, I asked for just a medium level of reconstruction, and it took half an hour. Uh, with high level, uh, he asked for, because it tried to give you an estimate that 
like for all the other software in the world, the estimate of how much time it will need is just uh, a number. Uh, but let's say it's accurate up to 20%, let's say. So it's, if it's an hour, it may be an hour and uh, 10 minutes and or something. Uh, but he, for having a more dense cloud, uh, he asked for one hour and 40 minutes. So still OK. I mean, it's not a thing that you need uh, now, otherwise you'll die. Um, it is a bit slower, so we have t we have tried both. Uh, we are now u normally using in everyday work both Visual SFM and uh, Photoscan. Visual FM, SFM seems to be a bit faster. Well, faster in the initial uh, the um, creation of the uh, calibration of the of the photo. Calibration orientation is really really fast. The accuracy between the two is uh, more or less the same. Uh, Photoscan will return more points, especially in those parts that I have less uh, textural information. Told you yest yesterday that if you try to acquire this wall, you will have some scattered points in the places where there is detail and nothing here. This is always true. However, there are areas of a building that may be <laughs> more or less correct, so that you can find detail, but the detail is very few. Visual FSFM sometimes leave those areas empty. Photoscan is able to compute more points even in the, those areas. Photoscan tends to generate po floating points, while Visual SFM produce less uh, ghost floating points. It's just a matter of filtering. So it seems like Visual SFM, well, PMVS uh, from Furukawa, uh, try to filter more the data. So you get less data sometimes. But the data is a bit more clean. Which one you use, it's on you. Uh, this is the dense cloud. I can, already inside Photoscan, create my 3D model, and then create a text for my 3D model. Because you see that if I just look at the geometry, the geometry is OK, but it's uh, yeah, OK. Uh, while if I look also at the color, This looks much, much better. So inside Photoscan, it is also possible to create a model. Again, you have to ask uh, at a specific resolution. So in this case, I, I was still a bit conservative in order to have uh, a result uh, quicker, plus the text. The 3D model is not really, I don't like it. Uh, the 3D model generates, sometimes it lacks a bit uh, the detail of the point cloud. So it seems that it's always using some uh, parameters that is very conservative. So in a lot of situations, we just export the dense cloud, and we do the merging inside MeshLab. But if you are on the field and you need the, the, the model that creates, and especially the text that it creates, is really, really nice. Remember that you may, uh, one thing that you sometimes do is um, you create, uh, you, you do align all the photo. Then you may remove some of the photo and create the dense cloud. Why? Why? Because you added to the set a series of photos taking the object from very far away in order to have uh, a better coverage, a more coherent and, um, and coverage. Uh, this thing is good for the initial ca uh, calibration and orientation, but since the photo are taken from far away, the detail is not that much. So you may want to remove those 
and to obtain a point cloud only using uh, the close photo, the higher quality photo. Then for the texturing, you may want to do the same. In this case, if I ask him to create the text, he will try to use all these photos, <coughs> which are a lot of photos. So even if the process is good and the alignment is good and everything is, uh, w went well, uh, you still have uh, a texture that is, uh, uh, that is fragmented in a lot of small images. And I told you to try keeping the same illumination all over, but there may be photos that are better and photos that are not so good as illumination. So you may want to reduce again, so you call out some of the photos that you don't like, and then you generate the text using only the highest quality photos. Or you may do the opposite. You may use uh, to text the object only the photo that frame the entire object instead of the detail. So you will have a more coherent color all over. Because this is a problem that we will encounter when, uh, when I will uh, speak about uh, photos and uh, texturing and photographic mapping. No matter how you are, how precise you are, and how fixed you put the parameters of the camera, when you take multiple photos of the same object, even just the fact that you move it from one position to the other, the color of the object inside the photo will change slightly. And when you do a composition of the text, you will be able to see this change. Again, the Pro version also save uh, autophoto plane, so especially if you're working on the ground, you can save uh, a single rectified image covering uh, an area, or uh, it may export directly in format that are usable by GIS software or other survey software. So it's a uh, it's a really useful uh, tool. Most of the things that you may do with this one, you may do it also with, with Visual SFM. So again, start using the free software, then try this one. This one also has uh, one month uh, free, so you may do all the experiment that you want, and uh, then you may decide if it's uh, worth uh, buying it or not. As a... Um, uh, educational since it has an educational license is uh, somehow convenient. Now I will uh, tell you a bit about one project. So I will start doing th that thing about um, describing uh, the use uh, of the 3D in, uh, in a complex uh, uh, project, which in this case uh, it's still ongoing. This is a collaboration between our lab and uh, a university in Sweden that uh, are documenting and working on a specific insula of Pompeii. Insula is just a city block, so an area with a lot of buildings and houses comprised between four, um, four streets. This, uh, this thing is a very complex geometry because uh, Roman cities were very packed, so everything was happening in very small places. So even though the second floor completely disappeared because of the, of the volcano, Pompeii is a Roman city in the south of Italy that was completely destroyed by uh, an eruption of a volcano. The interesting thing is that the volcano destroyed the city and uh, buried alive a lot of people. Well, not alive, they, 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 they died and then they, was, they were buried inside their, their houses. Uh, so it destroyed completely the top part of the building, which mostly was in wood. Uh, but the, the ashes and uh, the lava simply covered the city. So most of the city is still intact. So you can visit, you can go around these streets and see a city that is 2,000 years old that has been preserved 
uh, in a very astonishing way by the ashes and uh, by the, the, the remains of the um, eruption. So most of the internal wall and uh, some of the ceiling, not all, but uh, very few ceilings, are still intact. And uh, so you have a complete plan of the different houses. In this case, uh, uh, for example, this was one very large house. This was another house. This here, with the small entrance, and then uh, this block here, this is, was uh, closed before, was another house. Here you have uh, another large one, covered in this area here. This uh, is uh, uh, a bakery. And all everything else here, these small uh, things uh, here, this was a very small house, and all of these were commercial buildings. Um, the, the Swedish University has an ongoing project of documenting and studying this specific insula. We were involved years ago because we know a guy that works in, uh, in this university and said, oh, we should go with our terrestrial laser scanner and try documenting with a uh, detailed 3D model this main house and possibly some part of these other houses. So we, ga uh, we went there for uh, a couple of days and we were able to give this house completely and also completely this other house, plus uh, a lot of scan from uh, the road. Uh, so we decided next year, let's go and finish up the entire insula. Acquisition of this kind of stuff uh, is really, really complex. I told you that a terrestrial laser scan has a very wide uh, depth uh, of view, so it can acquire things in, in, in an entire square, so 70 meter of range, uh, our own, but the, the most modern one have also a uh, longer range. The problem here is uh, you are a lot, you have a lot of room that are 2 meters by 2 meters, so the range of the scanner means nothing. You will need to take a lot of scan and move constantly from one room to the other, taking care also of having a good overlap between each room and the next one. Because it is, uh, uh, in theory, it is possible to use markers to align all this stuff. But in practice, you will need hundreds, many hundreds of markers scattered all around. So you will spend a couple of days just to placing mark all over the place, which is uh, really inconvenient. For this reason, all of the scan are complete scan, so 360 degrees, so panoramic scan, complete panoramic scan. And uh, we carefully planned the position of the various scan. We had some idea looking at the map, and then going in the place, we were able to adjust the plan. So bear in mind that if you are going to work in a complex environment, it's really, really nice to have in advance some information like this one, just to, to see how many points, more or less, you will need to, uh, uh, to scan from. And when you get to the place, you will need to consider the, uh, the shape of the room, the size of the door, and the presence of occlusion. So if I want to scan this uh, room, I will start looking at uh, hidden areas, at uh, apertures, and at all the things that are inside. So, for example, I may think that I, if, if I place the, the scanner in the middle of the room, I'm more or less okay. This is true and not true. With the scanner in the middle of the room, I will get 70% uh, of, the, of the surface. However, there are a lot of areas that are completely hidden, because if you look at the ceiling here, 
you will see that there are these two beams plus these other two transversal uh, beams. So this part, I if the scanner is there, this part here is completely invisible. So I will need to scan uh, the thing from one point in the middle, because it's always good to have one acquisition point that is able to see everything more or less at the same distance because it will give out a point cloud that is uniform in coverage and then I will probably need a scan position here because in this way I will be able to see everything that is outside the, uh, the, the door so if I need to connect this data set to an external data set I will have this as a bridge and if I'm here I can see the inner side of this um, this beam plus the other area here so one two three exactly for the same reason that I did that and maybe I will go on the back of the of the classroom and do two other symmetrical so five point the problem is I will never be able to capture what's in between each row of the of the desk if I need to because I'm only interested in this room, there's no other way than taking a scan here and then in the middle of the next row and then in the middle of the other row. If it's possible to remove the chair, I may want to go here and scan in this way and then alternating. So all this consideration comes because you know how much you can get for a single position and you know which kind of uh, coverage you need. If you are just a structural uh, engineer and you want to evaluate the stability of this uh, thing, you may even just that four corner are okay because with each one you can see a part also of the mid, uh, mid uh, middle section of the room and you are done. So in this case the problem was most finding each each of these points is a single scan position. We managed to use uh, 300 uh, something, 318 if I'm not mistaken, but I uh, did it. So we tried to cover and we succeeded in covering all uh, the rooms uh, and uh, all the rooms save for one them. I still hate the thing because uh, the archaeologists were working so every time we move it to a new section they remove it all the equipment and they move it in another place uh, one room was a storage room so it was filled to the brim by meters by uh, equipment so we could not vacate it so we have the entire insula save for this room here and I still hate that I, we don't have that, uh, that room, but well, it's... Uh, we also covered the entire insula from the road. You see, staying, even if, uh, if I put a scanner here, the range of the scanner is able to reach uh, this point. But in this case, it will give a very dense uh, coverage here and a very sparse coverage here. So again, even if it was not strictly necessary, we moved in a very regular way, trying to cover again everything with the same resolution. We had this idea of covering as much as possible, possibly every room, with the resolution of, of at, uh, at minimum one centimeter then remember that every time you scan something and you add more cloud the resolution increase because you have a grid that has a one centimeter resolution and then you superimpose another grid that we, with different set of point again at one centimeter so it's not true that every time the resolution doubles but still you are getting more and more data uh, so it took two days the first year and three days the next year in order to have all this data coherently uh, to uh, this data uh, scanned 
I will show a couple of, uh, of range scans, for example. So if I load the This is one part of the scan, and it is just to this part here. So this is the entrance of a house, and this is the road. So what I see here is the sum of different scan aligned. So this scan was taken uh, from the road. We also had problem with uh, things like uh, uh, gates that still occlude uh, the view and, uh, and all the people moving because you see here that uh, people going around and uh, I told you uh, ghost-like so you, you see the guy that was moving plus other guys that were well, perfectly still doing the entire scan. We told him, do not look directly on the, on the rotating mirror, uh, because, well, uh, one word of, of advice. Laser scanner still use a laser. It's still very low in power. But if you are getting it in the eye, it's not a good idea. Most of those lasers are la eye safe. However, are eye safe for the occasional exposure. If you are working with scanner, try to not continuously look at the laser because it's not really nice. Some equipment uh, has uh, a class 1 laser, so do not look at the laser while it's scanning. Terrestrial laser scanner, especially if you are very near to the scanner, the amount of energy is a lot uh, and since it's in an, an invisible frequency, uh, it can damage your, uh, your eyes. So in most cases, a terrestrial laser scanner comes with glasses, very fancy glasses with uh, strange colored uh, lenses. It's better to avoid looking at the rotating mirror. For the occasional people passing by, just tell them, don't look at the mirror, it's okay. If they just uh, give it a glance, it's not a problem. You're not blinding anyone. Just be careful, because if you are working with this stuff, uh, it's not an occasional exposure. You continuously get this laser in, uh, in the eye. So we told him, not look at the... but he stayed like a statue. And all these things, uh, you have to remove it manually, because there's no way an algorithm can distinguish that this is a human being standing like this and not uh, a statue, for example. It's exactly the same stuff. When we did the cathedral in Pisa, I spent uh, one week in removing people and pigeons. Pigeons are evil and are everywhere. And when you merge it, you will find some, uh, some strange shape, and then you go back and, uh, and remove the thing. So alignment, in this case, we use uh, the same uh, stuff of alignment that I showed you the, uh, the other day. And we worked in chunks. So we aligned different areas of the, um, of the insula. Told you that the more points you put inside, the more scan the thing gets lower and slower and slower. For this reason, this, uh, um, this subdivision is uh, the subdivision that we used for the alignment. So we align uh, this house, which is called House of Cecilio Giocondo, because uh, uh, for some of the houses, archaeologists know exactly everyone that lived here, the name of the person, which was their trade, because they found a lot of documents, especially in this case, 
this, uh, this guy, Cecilio Iucundus, Cecilio Giocondo, is a very famous guy because it was uh, a, um, uh, an accountant for, it's not the correct term, for the Merchant Guild. So it was taking, uh, it was um, in his house, was full of commercial document of uh, import and export and on the commerce of the entire city. So when archaeologists dig up these, uh, these houses, they found an amazing amount of information about the commerce and everything else of the entire city. So we know exactly the guy that lived here, but we don't know about these other houses here. So some of the name has been uh, named uh, for an object that has been found, a, a specific object that has been found. So this is the, the house of the bronze uh, bull, because there was this uh, small statue of a bull. And uh, this other, I don't remember, of the epigrammy, because there are some writi writings on the wall. This is a bakery. I know it's a bakery, and I will show you why we know that it's a bakery. These, for example, are uh, places where the, the uh, cotton is, uh, and wool is dyed. So the, the, they have all these uh, water tanks uh, where they wash it and color it, um, things. And most of these uh, stuff here are just uh, taverna, so bar and uh, are places where you can get food on the fly sometimes, just go there. Uh, so we aligned this chunk, this other chunk, this one, this one, plus one, two, three, and four section. And then we try to attach together all these four section, all these uh, four plus uh, eight section. Uh, it was a very long and tedious process because aligning uh, a couple of rooms is a matter of few minutes. Aligning the entire house plus doing all that process that I showed you about, I find the, the worst arc, I try to correct it, I uh, optimize the thing, I do process, process, process. So the global alignment try to adjust more and more. Sometimes you find some scan that really don't want to get in the correct position, so you remove them, you work a bit again, and then you try to attach it from scratch. Sometimes you have to do this kind of uh, uh, more advanced alignment work. So it was already a problem to create for this four section plus all the four road, and then we had to put things together, trying to have some overlap between the, the area. So here you see that everything just stop, and a thing either is here or it's not here. Actually, we also got some overlap between the, the different areas in order to attach the, uh, the things. Anyway, we were able to align everything. So five days of scan, two scanning teams with two scan. Uh, it could be done faster, however you have a limit, the limit of the battery of your scanner. Because even if you can work eight hours a day, the, the battery of the scanner cannot work uh, this much. In this case, uh, some of the acquisition positions, so one, two, three, four, are quite close together. So it's just a matter of placing here, do a scan, I move, I do another scan. And we, se uh, we selected some scanning parameter that took uh, like five, between three and five minutes each single scan. Uh, the problem is uh, that the scanner has a limited uh, battery. Sometimes you have a spare battery, sometimes you don't. So when the scanner runs out of battery, you run out of uh, uh, time. So that's why five days. However, five days to cover the entire insula with this kind of precision is still a good time. For the alignment, we needed a couple of weeks. Not of continuative work, because in the first uh, 10 minutes of alignment, it's really 
point, click, 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 point, click, 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 click ta, 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 and things start going. After a while, each process, uh, each global uh, alignment takes minutes. The last uh, uh, one took like 20, 30 minutes, so it's a matter of I'm working maybe on uh, my laptop and I have on my desktop machine this thing running. I add the new scan or I change some parameters, I then ask process and then I return after 20 minutes or after half an hour. Things just get slowly, but in the end if we have to, uh, to establish how much time it took also because it was the first time we had uh, such a large and dense data set. Not such a large because we had uh, larger, that larger in the sense of uh, larger area, but the density of the data set was very high. So it was a lot of... Uh, the thing is, since you have a lot of overlap, the alignment comes out really, really nice. Because the thing about the rigidity, so each one is holding up the rest and everyone is pulling in the in uh, its own direction but since also in this area you have uh, five that covers this basically the same portion things get really really rigid so we are able to compute an alignment for the entire um, scanning area that was below the level of error that we uh, expected so in the end, the residual was around 2 cm, which for a thing that of this size, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty nice. By doing so, we, have, or, uh, we also have individual areas, so we can work on uh, individual areas. But we wanted to have a single model of the entire insula. So what we did was then to get all the points, flatten everything inside a single point cloud. Uh, possibly we tried to clean as much as possible all the things that could interfere in the, in the merging. So a lot of the people we cleaned it at them out, a lot of the ghosts we cleaned them out, a lot of the gate were removed. A lot, but not all. Beca why? Because sometimes problems just disappear if you don't look at them. Uh, the merging of all this data was carried out in order to have one point every, so we try to, to reconstruct the, the data at a resolution of uh, uh, 3 cm in the first try. At 3 cm resolution, everything that is much smaller than 3 cm disappears. So most of the floating point, most of the gates, most of the things just were removed by the merging. And what remained were floating stuff that can be removed automatically. Then we moved on a data set of 2 millimeters. And we tried to do again the merging. And we obtained uh, 2 centimeters, sorry. And we obtained again the merging. One important stuff. If you look at one single range map, like the one that I open, it's really, really, really detailed. You see that it took ages just to load that small area. If you keep the data at the maximum resolution, it will never be possible to work on this data set. So we worked on subsampled geometry, and then we moved on higher resolution geometry. So you acquire data at the maximum possible resolution, which in some cases is much higher than one centimeter. So from this raw data, what we did was, I have all the range scan as uh, the raw data. We generated a data set that was uh, subsampled throwing away all points that were closer than one centimeter. So we had a data set that was a one centimeter data set. From this one, again, we reduced the point, throwing away everything that was closer than two centimeter. And then again, three centimeter. So we have three copies of the same data 
one as, a resolu as the native resolution, one centimeter, two centimeter, and three centimeter. We start the alignment here at three centimeter because in this way you are much faster in doing this chunk alignment. When you have aligned this data set, remember that the alignment is just a position in space, a position and orientation. So it's just uh, uh, the alignment just tells you this range scan should be here. But this range scan mean this or this or this. So what we did was I start from here, I obtain an alignment, and then I apply it to this data set. And since now I do not have a gain to go and pick all the points because I already have a very good start position, I use this data set to improve the alignment. So we loaded the alignment using, instead of these, these two centimeters, we processed the gain and the error just uh, went a bit down. Then we took this thing and we placed it here and we did the same. At this point we stopped it because we were not able, because there was too much data, to do the same also for the raw data set. And since our target was one centimeter, we had, uh, we worked in, uh, in this thing. Yes? Uh, okay, we uh, there was a, um, we spent one afternoon in trying to find uh, uh, a strategy. So the normal work, so you have a state, you are building, you do uh, 12 scan, you align them, and you obtain the model. It's uh, it's straightforward. You just follow the thing that I showed. When you have this this situation, you just uh, have to plan a bit ahead of your work. So. Uh, when we do this, when we did the scan, we did uh, with some order, but not that uh, it was not possible to follow a very regular thing because the two scanner should be uh, in two different houses in order to avoid the laser to interfere one to the other. So the number that you will uh, you can see it here, but these numbers are in sequence, but they follow strange pathways. So first of all, we got all these name, all these uh, scans, and we renamed according to uh, the area, and possibly keeping numbers that were close together in a sequence that made sense. After this, we um, we did an initial cleaning of the data. So on the top, uh, on the row level. We throw it away, things that we just really didn't need. Then, we, uh, for each of the scan, we use the filter that I will show you later, that reduced the number of points according to the coverage, and we created another file. So we have uh, for a, a, a huge series of files. Actually, I think I have it here, only at... Um, I only here have the three centimeter data set. Bib, you, you see that there are various uh, file. So this is the, from the area of uh, Cecilio Giocondo, scan 067 underscore three centimeter. And we had different folder containing this various version of the data. Yes, it took out a lot of disk space, but it was the easiest thing. So to generate this, it can take uh, uh, not that much, let's say one hour, but it's, you, you do it once, and then everyone is working on the same data set. So uh, we organized the data, and it was a very 
efficient things to do because then we, we could get data from all the, all the different data set and everything is in the same reference space because you can use the alignment to load the data from one centimeter to three centimeter, everything in the same, uh, in the same space. So for each, uh, we, we rename it and we um, uh, subsample the different level and inside each one we have in each of these folder we have the partial alignment of the chunk so this file this mesh lab project will probably load up all the um, all the scans of the epigrammy house at three centimeter which are a lot of scans. I probably this was one thing no, not to do. Uh, let's see if it's able to, to load it up. The number of vertices is growing, growing, growing. So the, the data set in total was around 250 million uh, point. Uh, all over the, 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 the insula. So we were able to, you see how messy it is, because uh, you have uh, the area of the house, you have a hill nearby, all the people and uh, things also in the opposite insula. So if we now go close, You see also that some scan comes from the um, from a scanner that also captures color, like in this case. So this was one of the partial alignment that we used. It's a manual thing. And every time you use the resources that you have uh, in order, because there is no software that is, uh, for how much it is configurable or flexible, there is always some work that you have to do manually by moving stuff around and organizing the work at a higher level. That's, uh, that's it. So we then. Uh, um, we are still, uh, we haven't yet used the, the one centimeter data set for the global model. So the global model that I show you comes from the two centimeter data set. Because this is still uh, too large for uh, have a very good uh, merging. So most of the thing that you will see comes from here. And so what we got, so you see that I have a model called the 3 cm that comes from the data set at 3 cm and the model at 2 cm that comes from uh, the 2 cm data set. I will show it, it now using uh, MeshLab. It's 1.8 uh, gigabyte. It's not a very small uh, thing. And I will render it in points because in phases it takes uh, forever. But I want to show something now, and then I will move to another system to show better the, the result. Um, people from the university uh, also use uh, the total station to get uh, reference point. Not many, unfortunately. And they were not very well documented. So we are still waiting to have uh, good points for the georeferencing. However, we already did uh, using that, uh, the points that they gave us. And uh, so we can have uh, our 3D model in the correct position in space, uh, which for some um, situation it is good. 
the data set is really complete. However, it's missing a lot of areas that cannot be visible from ground. So all the rooms have been covered, say for the storage room. All the wall have been covered, all the floors have been covered. We are missing the top of the walls and the roofs. Why? Because there's no way to get higher than uh, that position. So we were unable to scan those, uh, those parts. It's fortunate, it, it, um, it's good that uh, most of the wall in Pompeii the top part has been reconstructed. So here you will see all the stones uh, or sometimes bricks, uh, original bricks. The top part has been filled with concrete in order to avoid water filtering inside and making the, the wall just uh, explode. Takes ages to load. Why so? It was much faster. I had the every time the Windows 10 just update, the the, the video card driver and all the software just uh, stop working until you reconfigure everything from scratch, which is pretty annoying. So this model is uh, 94. Uh, that's why 94 million triangle. I should not have loaded it. I will um, I will show it using another system. No, come on, it's eight gigabyte. I have sixteen. It should be able to. No, it should not. Let's pretend that this is happened. Okay. But I can show the model using this. So this is part of the project. So uh, most of the thing about the project is about documentation and study of this, um, of this insula. So the, there is a website, the Swedish Pompeii project, that contains a lot of information about uh, the, um, all the things that have been done inside the insula. So photographic documentation, uh, technical drawings, uh, annotation by the, um, by the archaeologist. So one idea was to create uh, a system that was able to display the 3D model online and connect this, this three-dimensional system to the uh, other website that was existing. So the people ideally should go back and forth and exp an exploration based on hierarchical web pages. So you have uh, each area with uh, each room documented with photos and text uh, and other information. Or you can explore um, virtually this area using some, uh, some interface and in a, at any moment jump between the text information, the, uh, the, the, the website which is already online and this. This is still an ongoing work, so this is um, an initial interface and I'm No, you know what? This still isn't is not using the accelerated video card. Yes. So how you make explorable a model like this? Because if you have, like in MeshLab, uh, that idea of a spherical trackball, it's good for an object. But here you have to provide something else. 
exploring a complex environment is a mess. It's always a mess, it will always be a mess, because there's no easy way to navigate an environment. So we implemented these things that looks like uh, a, um, a scale model. So you basically, this is your, the center of your attention. You are walking around the model and rotating, always pivoting on this stuff. This red thing here is the north, so this is a compass. You have the minimap, and if you click on uh, any point in the minimap, you will be teleported in that position. So if I, if I click here, the center of my, uh, of my screen will be in that position. The thing is also following the ground, because uh, if I go over this, uh, this mound here, this is done by encoding the height of the ground inside uh, uh, another data structure, because this is only rendering. So I don't have, I have the model online, I have the model available, but it's only for rendering. So I have uh, other layer of data beside this uh, minimap. The minimap you see, the graphical minimap, which is basically a screenshot from above, so you see the wall, you see the room. Plus I have another map that tells me the height of the ground, so I can uh, just uh, follow the contour of the ground. This is on a hill, so it's not a flat area. So there's uh, like one meter and a half between the lowest part here and the top part here. And this is the GIS uh, uh, reference system, so the local position. So the, I'm 36 meters above the, um, the sea level and east and north with respect to a point that is more or less here. So I have a reference point in this area and gives me the current position. This, uh, this other thing only works in this part which I have encoded because the uh, it's still uh, I told you it's still a prototype. So if I go in this part, I know each room. So when I'm in a, in a specific position, here it will tell me that which area, so the insula, and uh, which, uh, so which area in the sense that uh, this house and the room inside this house. So if I go down, you see that every time I go inside the room, or in an atrium, or in another, um, in another area, it tells me where I am. This thing can be connected, so the idea was we connect this thing to the website, so the website has a web page for each of these rooms, so since I know where I am, if I go, uh, if I click go to room web page, it will open up the, the Swedish Pompeii project web page, bringing me to the exact position, so in the, in the correct uh, web page. And from the web page, I have a link to open up this visualization in, with my uh, point of attention inside the, the, the current room. So in this way, I have my website that has uh, the classical two-dimensional uh, map uh, with all the rooms. Plus here you have the, the thing about like uh, the, the insula that is divided in houses and each house is divided in, uh, in rooms. So you can navigate on a 2D map, you can navigate on a hierarchical organization of the building or you can work navigate in the 3D, so you, it's a seamless exploration.